welcome to day two of Outdoor Retailer. Uh, we are going to get started in just about five minutes. Thanks, everyone, for coming out early before the show. I see some friends and familiar faces in the audience, so happy to have you here. Uh, this will probably be more of an intimate conversation between friends instead of a traditional trend presentation. We're going to kind of keep it chill. Um, I encourage questions and, you know, crowd participation as I go through it. Um, it's definitely also going to be a little bit more of a snapshot of what's happening in the market, so insights as opposed to a forecast. Uh, Promo Steel's giving their uh, design forecast later this, this afternoon, and I would ever suggest everybody check that out, especially in terms of product um, and color. This is going to be more from a marketing perspective. Um, if you guys don't know who I am, my name's Janine. I am the founder of Range. This is my 25th outdoor retailer. I have been coming since 2005 and doing trend presentations since. <laughs> um, very happy to be a part of this community. Um, this is, we're celebrating 35 summer markets um, for, for outdoor retailer, which is pretty impressive, I would say. Um, and I think it's 22 or 23 in Salt Lake City. So we've come a long way together. Um, and I'm very excited and eager to see what the next frontier um, is going to bring us in Denver. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Ranger Station or Range, we are um, we're a creative agency and we publish a, a newsprint magazine that is um, kind of the focus is the, des the intersection of design and adventure. So we definitely um, celebrate the creatives within the outdoor space. Um, we don't really lead with performance, we lead with um, storytelling and emotion and the way things make you feel and the way they look. And that's really fun because it gives us a really different voice within the industry. Um, we are also partners with Venture Out here. So the Ranger Station is kind of the community hub for art and activations and events and panels and parties, um, which is nice because we have a home. You know, it feels good to have a home here. I spent a lot of years dragging magazines around in a suitcase around this trade show, so it's definitely cool to have a place I can put my things down. Um, we also curate... Um, uh, an assortment of product from around a venture out. We call it a uh, radical by design. And uh, brands are encouraged to submit product for consideration before the show starts. And then we choose products um, out of those submissions that we feel um, represent kind of um, where design is heading in the outdoor industry, elevating outdoor adventure, but also really paying attention to design and color and shape and quality and material. Um, and then all those brands selected are then um, mer uh, merchandised within our booth here. So please feel free to check everything out afterwards. Um, my team is here. If you have questions, let just like reach out and let us know. Lisa's uh, back here taking photos. She handles our social media, our digital marketing, and our brand partnership. So if anybody's got questions for her, let us know. Andrea is actually working on the magazine and ad sales. So if anyone's interested in any ad sales for the mag, check her out. And Nina is here representing our client services division. And um, a lot of what we do behind the scenes is work closely with clients on product development, trend and concept, content creation, some strategy. So we're kind of a range of things here. Um, and we wear a few different hats. Um, so yeah, that's my general spiel. So we can kind of get going. Um, as I mentioned, is everyone okay with the screen? Everyone can see it? This is gonna definitely be more of a snapshot of uh, market trends as opposed to just a traditional forecast. So I've told you already a little bit about r what Range does. We are a creative agency dedicated to the outdoor, active, and lifestyle market. We specialize in content creation, trend and concept, product development, strategy, storytelling, connecting with people, helping little brands become big brands, and big brands figure out what little brands are doing. <laughs> um, it's kind of an interesting place to be because we work with everybody, in e almost every brand in this, in this convention center in a different kind of capacity. So it's really interesting. Um, for this presentation here, we're going to look at three different market trends that are having an effect right now on the industry, and will continue to do so. Again, not so much of, as a two to three year forecast, but a, this is what's happening now, and if you're not paying attention, you should react quickly to it. Uh, the first trend here is activist impact, and it includes um, initiatives and product releases, as well as a specific look at developments for inclusivity, family, and gender. So this is about diversifying the outdoor industry. Uh, the second trend, Maker Made, is about exploring handcrafted trends, the authentic maker movement and culture within that movement. 
um, and things that could be relevant for this potential consumer. And the third trend is called urban minded. And this is really just an evolution of how we've seen the outdoor industry starting to influence um, and have an, a lasting effect on urban outdoor enthusiasts. What's really important, I think, and one of the biggest takeaways here is that global consumers are evolving and they are more interested in brands that have values and that are making a statement with their purchasing than and making a statement with their purchasing power. And I think that's really like one of the biggest takeaways. And we'll probably talk about values a lot in this presentation. Um, because that, that's I think that's what's driving the industry at the moment. Start with some really important data. Um, this is from the Outdoor Recreation Economy Report, and we're so lucky to have this data in real time available to us, because I don't think we really understood the power that the outdoor industry had as a whole. Um, up until this year, we were throwing the number around, it was $646 billion. That was a guesstimate of how much of an influence the outdoor industry had on the GDP and the global, or the national economy, excuse me. And now that we've got this research, these hard numbers, we actually know it's $887 billion, which the outdoor uh, industry uh, adds uh, value to the economy on an annual basis. It generates uh, $24.5 billion in annual federal, state, and local taxes. So that's combined. That's pretty impressive. And if we were to compare it to something really popular like sports, team sports, um, more Americans participate in outdoor recreation than attend NFL, N NBA, MLB, and NHL games combined. So 145 million people participate in outdoor recreation, and only 134 million um, participate in all of those activities combined. So what does that mean? It means we have a lot of power. A lot of power for purchasing, a lot of power for pushing product forward, a lot of power for storytelling and connecting with our customers and consumers. It means that we have an avid audience that's ready and willing to absorb what we present to them. And I always think, Brands and businesses are most successful when they find a hole in the industry and they fill it. When they recognize there's a niche in the market that has not yet been met, and then they raise and rise to the occasion to fill that hole within the market. So the outdoor industry is, is here. Uh, our consumers are open to what we have to share with them, the products we have to provide for them, and it's a really incredible time because, as you know, data reigns supreme. It's all about ROI, it's all about the numbers at the end of the day. We could have the best ideas out there, but unless we can provide the data to support the, those ideas, no one's listening um, in terms of key stakeholders um, in brands and companies. So it's really cool to have it. Um, it's also, uh, the outdoor industry is also responsible for 7.6 million jobs in the US. And that's pretty impressive, I would say. Um, in addition, I'd actually like to mention, too, uh, OIA just released their um, economic data on all 50 states yesterday. So if you want economic data on the state that your brand or business is based in, you can now find that state by state um, on OIA's website. So I would definitely check that out. So some of the key values we're going to touch on in this presentation, and these key values you'll find show up in each of the trends that we're going to talk about. The first is community outreach, empowerment. Um, we're seeing brands come together with uh, not-for-profit and purpose-driven um, companies to create product for underserved people within the community. Um, Polar Tech just teamed up with Open Style Lab and Paradox Sports, which is an adaptive climbing company, to create apparel for adaptive climbers, um, something I think is really interesting. Um, it's all about building community here. There's tons of new um, youth and adult development programs and leadership programs coming out of the space, either connecting small business owners with other small business owners or youth with getting outdoors or um, women with other women, um, people of color with more access to the outdoors. I mean, it's just about this idea of empowering the community to get outside and bringing all of these forces together to kind of um, create these strong bonds within those communities. And we're also seeing a big push for diversifying outdoor. Um, you know, it's been far too long since we've seen um, color on stages. And, you know, we have panels on diversifying outdoor, and there's not people of color on those panels. You know, we've had this problem happening in the outdoor industry for quite a long time. And I don't think just it's just about color. It's about gender. It's about um, gender fluidity. It's about, you know, 
it's about everything. And, and right now we're kind of tackling all these really touchy subjects um, and it makes people uncomfortable and it makes people feel strange, but I think it's time to really look um, ourselves in the face and the eyes and like really come to grips with how the community is changing and what we can do to better serve the community as it changes. Another key value is the family. It's not just about getting guys outside or getting women outside, it's about getting our entire families outside. And this has really changed because outdoor has always been about performance and survival and, you know, putting in time outside and sacrificing and, and you know, earning your stripes to be considered an outdoor person, right? And now it's about, uh, it's about almost taking a step back and, and going back to, nature as like a healing property and, and a unifying property and bringing the family structure together. I mean, there's a big, there's a big problem right now with getting kids outside. Kids are really glued to their iPhones, they're glued to their mobile devices, they're having a hard time focusing. Um, if I'm sure I have a child, I often, as soon as she starts freaking out, take the iPhone out and put on Sesame Street and she calms down. And, and you know, I think that's the easy solution, but I think we need to be challenging ourselves to engage our children and to get them outside. Um, and we will talk about this a little bit more in depth throughout the presentation, but the idea of family, and not just mom, but mom, dad, and children, all of us. Um, it's, an, it's a generational experience being outdoors, and we need to celebrate that. Um, we're also seeing a big emphasis on adventure moms and programs just for moms. Um, there's the Outdoor Mom Adventure Academy. There is um, a few Outdoor Mom podcasts I can fill you in on. Um, and again, it's about giving women the tools and confidence to get outside with their children. Um, because I think after, after you have a child, it's a very lonely experience and it's a great opportunity for people to connect, um, find their tribe again, gain some, back, gain some of that confidence back and get back outside and connect with people. Um, in nature where, th where things always, um, you know, seem to have a really lasting effect. And family festivals are also really kind of having a, a, an emergence. We're seeing um, the Forest Family Festival, which is produced by Hike It Baby. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Hike It Baby. It's a national um, organization of families around the country that, and they host meetups, um, hikes, events, educational seminars about getting families outdoors and they're doing there, uh, there, I think there's four different locations for the, um, the, the Family Forest Fest this year, which is cool. Um, another key value is um, basically, again, uh, you know, circling around inclusivity is the LGBTQ community. So it's really interesting because this is the first time um, that we're seeing openly gay or queer professional athletes coming out in the last few years it's been a trend in, in the action sports industry specifically. And it's kind of starting to have an effect here in outdoor. And it's definitely not something we've ever talked about. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because when you talk about outdoor, we talk about, you know, again, performance and function and survival and pounds and ounces and how much things weigh and how they make you look and feel. But we've never really talked about it, you know, in terms of like, the dimension of the community that takes part in outdoor. And it's not just for one community, it's for all communities. Um, Lacey Baker is uh, the first female queer professional skateboarder to be sponsored by Nike. So Brian Anderson, who's um, a personal hero of mine, came out as a openly gay skateboarder a few years ago, and that was a big deal within the, in the community. He's also sponsored by Nike. Um, and he brought Lacey onto the team as the first woman um, in the industry to be recognized as an openly queer woman. And what's really interesting, I read an article um, in Vogue that they did, they did a big profile on her in Vogue. And I thought one of the best um, quotes from the article was that she's queer, straight, male, female, both and or neither, she's everything. And we know that gender fluidity is again, a very touchy topic, but something that's becoming more and more apparent. Um, another really interesting thing I noticed, um, REI actually for Pride Month, um, promoted, um, let all of basically their employees and friends and family of the brand march um, in pride festivals around the country with um, the banner was outside with pride. So REI kind of, again, taking a really committed stance to supporting the community and um, making it okay, almost in a way. I mean, I think what's really strange about our industry is sometimes we need big brands to make things okay in order for the rest of us to be like, oh, all right, we can talk about this now. So again, touchy topics, but all interesting topics and things that need to be discussed. 
Um, I really love this quote here. This is Kate Arnold. She's got a column on outside. The outdoors should be accessible to everyone, regardless of financial status or ethnic background. And we know that because we know that outdoors and, the nat and nature in, in general is healing. And right now, I think we all could be <laughs> healed. <laughs> I think we could use some healing as a big uh, you know, as a consensus as a, as a country. I mean, I think there's a big divide happening, unfortunately, within the current administration. And I think um, maybe a path towards healing some of those divides is through, is through getting outdoors together. Continuing the conversation about gender, we know that gender neutral clothing is really becoming more and more relevant. I, knew, I know as we have um, conversations about gender fluidity within the country and trans um, gender people, I mean, there's so many things we could talk about and I won't get into them because they are very politically fueled. But we're seeing um, big companies embrace gender neutrality. For example, Target just released a gender neutral clothing collection for kids, um, which is really interesting. There is um, an online retailer called Clothes Without Limits that features brands that fall into the gender neutral category. So users can browse by age, theme, company, but not by gender. And I think that's really interesting. And in terms of product, we're actually seeing um, brandless, brandless advertising having a moment. I don't know if anyone remembers like no frills products in the supermarkets and like Pathmark. They were white packages that had just generic branding and everything was the same. Um, the reason those products didn't do well is because they weren't really made with great materials and they weren't really premium products. Um, a new company just launched a few weeks ago called Brandless. They are an online um, supermarket where everything costs $3. Basically, they figured by cutting out the brand tax that's um, attached to all of our brands, they could charge less money for the same premium materials. So. All of the products are non-GMO, organic, um, you know, c certified products, but they're three dollars because there's no national brand name attached to it. Um, it's also happening in the beauty industry as well. We're seeing um, general clean beauty products across the board that aren't um, beholden to one specific brand or brand identity, and that gives brands the ability to charge less and to sell direct to the consumer and cutting out the middleman um, and creating more profits for them and, and then being again able to service their, their consumers with the best of the best ingredients available. Um, women owned and run, you know, I'm constantly talking about women. Uh, it's kind of my thing. Um, I've been talking about them for a decade here at Outdoor Retailer. <laughs> What are we up to? What do we want? What are we doing? You know, and I'm at this point where I'm ready to pass the torch on to the next generation of women to talk about women. <laughs> and I want to focus on um, boss ladies that are kind of just running the show and owning things. What's really been cool is like when I started doing presentations about the modern outdoors woman here at Outdoor Retailer, it was very new and fresh and very controversial because it was like no one was talking about this either. And now it's like if you aren't having a conversation about women and not in the sense of them being like a token addition to your marketing campaign, you're kind of, your brand's not listening and you're falling flat and you're missing a really big opportunity. Um, because now we're the bosses, you know, we've transitioned from these support roles into CEOs. There are multiple women owned brands out there that didn't exist even five years ago. I've met and, and, and worked with a lot of them within this space of Venture Out. Um, and there's a lot of um, resources for us now, which is really cool. We have Canberra Outdoors Pitch Fest, which happened two days ago, where women were able to come and pitch their business plans and ideas to um, executives and, and VPs and CEOs and get immediate feedback on the direction they were taking their brands in, which is really cool. Um, there is the Women's Outdoor Summit. The first one just happened in San Francisco. That was organized by Teresa Baker. Um, who is the founder of the African American Nature and Parks Experience. And she had um, Rose Marcario from, C from Patagonia. C she's the CEO of Patagonia. Um, Dr. Carolyn Finney, she's the author of White Spaces, Black Faces, Reimagining the African American Relationship to the Outdoors, in addition to many other inspirational women. And it was a full week of women's um, programmed activities geared towards small business and entrepreneurship. So not just like, let's go outside and camp. It was like, let's get down to business and figure out how to be, be better business women, better business people, better citizens of this world, um, better to each other. 
And a lot of it was about race and gender. There was a lot of discussion about that. And it was hard for people to have those conversations in a pretty predominantly white environment. Um, but what, what I was told, I wasn't there. I was unfortunately on a, a, pl a project with a client. But what I was told was once people started having those tough conversations about gender and race, the whole mood in the, in the room shifted. And it went from being a strange conversation with women feeling intimidated by each other to a very open-ended conversation where people were willing to tackle difficult things um, as a group. So that was really cool and interesting. And I think women have a capacity to do that. Um, my friend Alyssa Vervicio, she's the founder of Hip Camp, she said, you know, we were in an REI film not that long ago together, and she said that um, what makes women great leaders is that we are um, emotional and vulnerable. And that's typically seen as kind of a negative, right? You know, oh, she's so emotional, she's making emotional decisions. But, you know, we have empathy and we can feel, um, we can feel what our teams are feeling. And I think we can react to it and we can feel um, you know, the connections that we feel with our teams are a little bit stronger because of it. Um, and in terms of redefining women, you know, there's a, tr there's a panel tomorrow called Redefining Women, <laughs> literally. And these are women I've worked with on multiple occasions, um, creating content with and doing panel discussions with. It's Jen Grecki from Coalition Snow, um, Amanda from uh, Wild Women's Project, and they're going to, again, like I said, I'm passing the torch to them to kind of continue this conversation about women. But what I think is the most interesting is that we are not willing to be satisfied with what exists for us. You know, we are irreverent and we are unapologetic and we are demanding better product, demanding better brands, demanding better storytelling and more sincere and authentic marketing. We're not willing to sit idle and wait for our turn. Um, and I think that's the big shift. You know, at first it was like, let's talk about ladies. What are they up to? And then it was like, cool, we all, oh, we're all here together. Oh, look how many of us are in this room. And then it was like, oh, we're in charge. I think we're in charge. We actually represent 51% of the buying power of that $887 billion generated in the outdoor industry. That's a lot of leverage. If this was a business, we would own more of the business than the men in the room. But where are we in terms of leadership positions? You know, where are, are we there yet? I don't think we are. I think we're just starting to really explore um, the power that we have as a collective, as, as women. Um, and as a feminist, like, it isn't really about just focusing on gender in terms of, like, women or not women. Like, I'm not for or against men. <laughs> it should be all of us, you know? Like, we need to come together as a society and support and empower um, each and every one of us. And I don't think it's about being a woman that's gonna make you a better leader. I mean, I definitely, like I mentioned earlier, we have it has its advantages in terms of empathy and sympathy and vulnerability, but I just think it's about being the best person for the job. And I think a lot of the women in this industry are the best people for this job. Sally Jewell spoke yesterday to kick off the um, OR breakfast, and I couldn't Think of a more inspirational woman to look up to in terms of just being a leader. Uh, Rose Macario, like, same. You know, you can't argue with the fact that they're women or they're, they're leaders. They're just good at what they do. Um, Lynn Hill, which was one of my favorite people to think and talk about in the world, you know, she's just such an amazing inspirational climber and, and created has achieved so many firsts for women. Um, she said, we want to be treated equally. If we want to be treated equally, we have to demand it. We have to ask for it and we have to go out and get it. So I think that's the big shift. It's not about you know, asking permission anymore, it's about going and taking what we want. Um, our first trend here again um, is going to be focused on um, activist impact, it's called. And it is about focusing on brands that are driven by purpose, not profits. It's about the leveraging the power of the outdoor industry as a group. Um, it's about shining a light on activist brands that are willing to go out on a limb and take one for the team, just in order to kind of push their agenda through. Um, it's funny because we are having such an incredible moment um, on a national national role um, with the, the policies that we're fighting against within the administration. And I don't know there any other industry that's willing to do that. And I'm personally really proud to be part of an industry that cares so much about the environment and about protecting public lands. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're gonna touch on here. 
This is an image um, of Parks Project. I think I saw Savag out in the audience somewhere. Um, I think they represent this theme um, wholeheartedly. They create apparel um, to celebrate and protect the national parks of this country, and they donate proceeds and of their sales back to those national parks. They also create films um, to celebrate the national parks and do their role um, in terms of community engagement and park cleanups and, and getting people together. And I mean, I think that they really represent um, a big piece of this direction and this market trend. Um, and again, it's this idea of brands being driven by purpose and not profits. That's really what's important. Um, as we look at the collective leverage of our industry, we're going to see values in action, purpose, not profits, entrepreneurial conservation, social impact programs. And this is all going to be very much community driven. Um, interestingly enough, Apple watches just announced that they're going to be donating proceeds of their sales and all of their um, iWatches to the national parks. Um, I think it's only like a dollar, but it's something. And the fact that Apple's like taking a stand and standing with us as, a, as an industry I thought was very interesting. Tim Cook, um, the CEO of Apple said, our goal is to leave the world a better place than we found it. So this, um, so we're making it easier for anyone to help preserve the beauty of our natural, cultural, and historical treasures. And I thought that was really cool. Um, Gap Own Athleta is committed to more sustainable business practices and aims to put them in place by 2020. So we're not just seeing this in outdoor, we're seeing this in active as well. For example, they're shifting to 80% um, of their materials to sustainable fibers, 80%. It's kind of a big deal. Um, they're focusing on water saving initiatives and diverting 80% of their waste from stores um, to be recycled. So any, rem any remnant um, products that aren't sold, they're, they're recycling them in a closed loop program when, when potentially possible. Um, they're also going to be reducing its carbon footprint by 50% and supporting 10,000 women globally through their education focused PACE program um, through fair trade initiatives. So that's like a lot, right? So they're promoting sustainable materials. They're promoting recycling, responsible manufacturing, fair trade manufacturing, supporting women, <laughs> makers around the globe. I mean, it's not just like, we're going to try to make things better. We're going to work on some packaging. It's like, here's a multi-prong approach to how we can make our company better. And I think that other brands are going to look to them to see where they can fill in those um, holes as well in their own companies. And I think we need big brands uh, oftentimes to kind of push us out of our comfort zones to take chances in that direction. Um, OIA's new brand campaign, Together We Are a Force, is really amazing. Um, they're bringing together key business, political, athletic, and conservation figures across the outdoor industry to um, represent the power of the outdoor industry um, and, again, raise awareness about protecting public lands, which is really cool. And I think now more than ever, we're just seeing this really immediate, direct reaction to protecting things that are sacred to us, conserving our ability to be outside. Um, I don't know where we would be in this industry if we didn't have access to the outdoors. We wouldn't have businesses. We wouldn't be able to service our customers and clients. So this is more important now than ever. Um, you know, REI obviously has taken a very public stance on um, the national parks and protecting and conserving public lands, as is Patagonia. And it's funny because I'll be on their social media feeds and really kind of looking to see how people are responding. And I would say 90% of people are, are really proud of them. You know, they're like, yeah, stand up for what you believe in. Take a stand. Like, be the voice for us. Advocate for our public lands. And then 10% of people are like, stay out of this. This isn't your territory. And my question to those people is, how is the environment not their territory? How is protecting the environment not our responsibility as outdoor enthusiasts, consumers, brands, retailers? We are the last line of defense between the administration and, and, the, uh, and the environment right now. And I think we have to take real serious ownership of that. There's also a lot of conversation around positive consumption, which I think is really cool and awesome. And again, this is an image from um, the, the, um, the new line from um, Parks Project um, the, about defending public lands. This is their um, Parks Project Defend Our Parklands collection. So it's OK to be an activist right now, which is cool. I went to the Women's March in DC, and I'd never felt more alive in my entire life. And as you all know, there's a march happening right here in Salt Lake City later today. Um, 
this land is our land. We'll be marching here from our booth if everyone wants to join us. But again, it's this idea of harnessing the power we have as an industry to affect positive change. And it's so cool and empowering to be part of that in real time. We all have a voice. We all have the ability to move the needle and to bring attention to the programs we're passionate about. And I don't know if there's ever been a time where that's happened. Um, I really love the collection from Chaco's. They teamed up with the National Parks as well, and they did a series of Z sandals to celebrate um, all the different national parks and monuments. And this is Stonewall National Monument in the West Village, which is the epicenter of the LGBTQ movement um, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in New York City. And again, it's like going out on such a limb we've never really seen outdoor embrace all facets of the community, which I think is really cool and empowering. Um, and then um, this image here at the bottom is actually um, <clears throat> a sports bra initiative to get young women in sports bras that fit them. Because studies find that girls begin dropping out of sports at the onset of puberty because they don't feel comfortable. So again, it, it could be really high. It could be fighting for public lands, or it could also be a little bit more, um, you know, realistic to like what we're experiencing, you know, getting women in sports bras that fit them and, and, and in encouraging more participation in outdoor sports through that outreach. And, um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of cool how that works. I really love this quote here from Rose Mercario, again, the CEO of Patagonia. In the end, the great brands will be the ones that have vision to face facts square in the eye and take action, radical action. And I don't know of another industry that's more punk rock than the outdoor industry. Our roots come from garages and vans and, like, the grassroots community. I mean, we have more power than they even realize. And I think that there's something to be said about that. Yesterday we had a panel on considered consumer values. And Michael Jagger, who's the founder of um, Solidarity for Unbridled Labor, he was also the founder of JDK, he said the activist brands are the brands that are going to lead us into the future. And that's scary, because like we don't want to alienate anyone. We want to be inclusive. We want to be open. But if we don't take a stand and we don't have a position, we don't have anything to say. You have to have something to say. And why not be on the side of history that is protecting the environment? I almost said the side of history that's right, but that would be <laughs> not the right thing to say. Um, we're also seeing a big push um, towards activist athletes, so athletes that are just brand ambassadors taking a stance for protecting the environment in a way we've never seen. Jeremy Jones, um, who's a, an iconic snowboarder, big mountain snowboarder, he started Protect Our Winners. He recently testified in front of Congress about the effects of climate change, which are really, really dramatic. Dramatic, I just made that word up. <laughs> dramatic, as you know. Um, and the climate, uh, the People's Climate March in Washington, D.C. was flooded with athletes and activists from all over the country um, joining forces to kind of um, take a stand for what they believe in, which was really great. Um, we're actually selling these uh, Range and Mizu water bottles um, at the booth uh, and donating all of the proceeds to protect our winners. So if you are interested in helping us do our small part, uh, please let us know and we can get you uh, hooked up with one. Um, you know, and sometimes it just takes art to get the point across. So um, I love this tote bag here. This is actually also from Patagonia. A friend Jeff Holstad designed it. You can't eat, you can't eat money. You can't eat money. Um, and I think that's kind of all I need to say about that. You know, we can use, um, we don't just have to like, stand on a stove box and scream, we could also use art uh, and graphic design um, to get our, our visual messages across. Um, at the bottom there, that direct action program, that's a project by David Buckley Borden. He partners with the Harvard Forest Project. He's a fellow at Harvard to create um, science-driven educational art. So he creates all of these different um, installations and parks throughout the country about um, climate change and science and data, and it's really interesting because he's basically trying to create a conversation around science through art, which is really interesting. 
Our second theme here, Maker Made, is about celebrating the art of craft. I mean, this isn't going to go away. You know, this is about the slow fashion food living movement. This isn't just about handmade this or handmade that. This is just about slowing things down, buying less, buying better, premium materials, eco materials, celebrating the art of craft. Um, and this is a theme we've been talking about for years, and this will still continue to affect um, consumers' decisions in, when it comes to purchases going forward. Um, again, like I said, it's a both craft and heritage uh, story, but there's a bit of a holistic connection, and we're definitely bringing our indoor and outdoor lives together in a way we've never seen happen before. Um, I think it's really kind of neat. I love this quote here. All is related to an art of living, an art of seeing differently, more slowly, and more locally. So again, a reaction to fast fashion, a reaction to overconsumption. This is about reining in how much product we're producing and only producing things with intention, whether that be experiences, whether that be food. It's really about creating things that have a purpose and a reason to be here. Um, you know, I think something really interesting is millennials look at their, the boomer generation, their parents, and they say to themselves, I don't need all the stuff you have, you know? I don't need the car, I don't need the boat, I don't need the big house, I need a small house, I need a manageable amount of things, I wanna live my life in a state of uh, fluidity. You know, I wanna be able to be um, flexible. I don't wanna have all of these things holding me down and anchoring me down, and I think all of this plays a role in this mindset. Um, agro initiatives are becoming incredibly important. Um, definitely an evolution of glamping. We're seeing agro-tourism having a really big, um, right now, lasting impression. There are um, things like farm and land, which is a new concept. It's a, it's a retreat that combines outdoor experiences with farming and local ingredients and be uh, honey making and craft and kind of celebrating the art of craft, but in also combined with like outdoor experiences like camping and hiking, which is really interesting. Foraging, obviously we still want to have a place in that kind of maker world, seeking out things. Um, and we're even seeing um, farm to table and farm to fork kind of movements influence big uh, brands and campaigns. The image here at the bottom is from a recent project that Subaru just did um, called, uh, excuse me, let me find the exact name of it, called um, Ground and Green, and they partnered with a chef, um, Andrea Bemis, to do a farm dinner with locally sourced produce and foodies, but again, it was Subaru doing it. So not your typical farm to table um, supporter, right? Kind of out of context, but I think they're seeing the importance of um, this emerging movement in the connection between sustainability, food, and social experience. Um, Filson is actually also partnering with um, a cattle ranch called Rangelands to encourage ranch ranching ed education to the public at large. They're offering um, an opportunity to attend workshops, whether that be painting or birding and explore, hunting and fishing, um, and basically camping on the actual ranch. And they're all Filson branded tents. And again, it's this idea of bringing all of these things together. <clears throat> We're seeing food become incredibly important in outdoor in a way we haven't. Um, there's a big resurgence with the Dutch oven and this return to slow cooked foods at the campsite. Um, this new camp cookbook that came out um, was actually the number one release on Amazon for a month, and um, I think still is kind of high up there. It's definitely been an editor's pick on Amazon, but again, it's about creating better meals while camping. Good to go is here in, in Venturel. I mean, they're, they make um, dehydrated camp foods, but it's all gourmet. It's, it's mushroom risotto, and it's pad thai, and it's really enhanced and elevated camp food, you know, and it's giving us this opportunity to elevate the experience. Um, Primus, who's also here in Venture Out, if you've stopped by their booth, they're not just making a camp stove, you know, or something to boil water in. They're creating, like, 
they're taking the chef, chef tools and bringing them to the campsite, which is really cool and interesting. I love this roll up here, which has all of the like, you know, special tools you'll, you would need to create something really romantic at your campsite. We actually also have a few products here at the booth, um, bamboo utensils and things of that nature. Again, it's just taking things out of context and elevating them a little. And this idea of considered craft continues to be important. So the art of making, celebrating, makers, small batch, limited runs, things that are made to order. What I think is really cool here, um, this surfboard shaper here on the left, um, his name is Jacques. He lives on a ranch up in Maine. He, surf shape, he s shapes surfboards. He's a pig farmer, and he's a science teacher. <laughs> and he has a very pared down, pretty simple life, and he's kind of re relying on the things that he loves and drives him and that he's passionate about um, to keep him happy. Um, we've also got um, shepherdess hides. We actually feature um, a few of them in our Range Magazine issue. Um, they are working on um, sourcing sustainable hides, sheep hides, um, out in California, and you know, just kind of celebrating the art of of craft and doing it ethically and responsibly at the same time. We're also looking at this kind of road trip refined thing that's happening. I guess the evolution of van life and glamping. Um, we're seeing the indoor experience inspiring our outdoor experience um, in terms of our life on the road. So um, for example, we've got an, a, a new smaller Airstream that the interior looks like something right out of a, a home blog. Um, I think this is all kind of the effect of like the tiny home movement and Instagram and getting a peek into people's homes and how curated and elevated they are. There's also another really cool Instagram account I follow called the Modern Caravan and they literally gut Airstreams and use like Heath ceramics and um, all sustainably sourced cedar, and everything is done to the nines, you know, and it's just beautiful. And it's interesting that, like, you know, van life was very much about, like, kind of a dirt bag um, sensibility, you know, and it's okay to have a smelly van and we're just sleeping in it, but now it's, like, curating this whole space for your home, and I think this complements the cooking side, and it complements the sustainability side in terms of how we're eating. Um, it all kind of creates this ambiance that feels very uh, elevated. We're actually also seeing um, natural performance fibers getting a little bit more um, play within the industry. Um, clean color dyeing techniques, renewable performance fibers, understated tech, adventure denim. Everything here is built for ultimate durability and adventure. So um, Western Rise, which I'm not sure if anyone's here from Western Rise, they have a new dry weight merino made out of nylon um, and merino, which is really beautiful. That's that there on the bottom with that kind of heathered effect. Um, Patagonia is doing a um, clean color collection where they are using dyes derived from bio waste like, and fruits like mulberry and pomegranate rather than petroleum, um, which is really cool. Um, Outlier just released um, a linen, uh, tech in injected linen. So it's a linen um, finish, but it has properties of, um, there's moisture wicking properties, and it's antimicrobial, and it's anti-wrinkle, which we all know linen is not anti-wrinkle typically. So again, it's like taking the combination of these natural materials and giving them the understated tech for the support and the performance. And in speaking of fibers, hemp um, getting not nearly enough as much attention as it should, um, it is one of the most durable natural fibers on the earth. It requires no irrigation, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, or GMO seeds. Our, friend, um, our friends at Young Maven are on a mission to get everyone in a hemp shirt by 2020. Um, it's really funny is that hemp is, is legal to grow almost everywhere in the world except the U.S., and it makes very little sense. Um, cannabis culture in general is obviously gaining momentum. Um, I'm very interested to see how that plays out as we move the show to Denver. I think it opens the opportunities for a lot of new business ideas and collaborations. Um, what's really interesting about the cannabis culture, um, there's a new report from uh, Frontier Data that projects that by 2020, legal cannabis, the legal cannabis market will create more than a quarter of a million jobs. 
um, and it has an, an estimated worth at 7.2 billion right now in, two, in 2016, with a projected um, growth rate of on an annual basis of 17%. So that's really big, and there's a lot of market share there. And we're kind of seeing the shift towards stoner products to very high-end, heightened products as well, which is also really cool. Um, this image here on the left is a, a company called Humboldt. Um, and they create really beautiful design-driven, industrial design-inspired, um, I guess you'd call that a one-hitter, if you, <laughs> a vape pen. <laughs> but beautiful and, and really thoughtful and intelligent. So I think that we're going to see a big shift in, in the cannabis culture towards this sentiment and this sensibility. And then our last theme for this um, presentation is urban minded. And again, this is just an evolution of the conversations we've been having about an urban, a shift towards urban outdoor enthusiasts and um, what that means for the market. Um, we need to create better product for this consumer, design-driven product that functions in a variety of environments, not just for the outdoors, but also in the city. And that's way apparent here in Venture Out as we look at some of the brands uh, showcasing some of their goods. This quote here is really nice. The future will also see people indulging their yearning for nature in the city. So it's not just about nature um, in a traditional outdoor environment. It's also nature in, in the city. So experiencing that and what that means for um, city dwellers around the country. It's about accessible adventures, micro adventures, urban escapes, things that are really easily accessible. Um, Nor uh, North Face just teamed up with Outbound Collective um, to create regional guides for um, trips that are accessible from major metropolitan areas, which I think is really interesting. Camelback also has a pursuit series where they have summer camps with expert guides and pro athletes that show you um, how to interact with nature in a more sustainable way within uh, local cities and metropolitan areas. There's also um, the Outdoor Fest in New York, which is a full two weeks devoted to m programming all day long um, from fly fishing and mountain biking to kayaking all centered and circled around people living in New York City, which is really neat. Um, also something that's really interesting I found in my research is that the stand-up paddle market, specifically inflatables, are um, responsible for 80% of the market right now in the stand-up paddle because people in cities are purchasing them and using them um, because they're easily storable. Even, I think you could probably also talk about like an Oru kayak or something that was easily um, dismantable, something that you could store in a small space. But I think in general, the idea of products that will fit into the homes of urban creatives and urban outdoor enth enthusiasts are gonna become equally important. Um, nature's classroom, I think this is really fun. Um, going back to the conversation we were having in the beginning of the presentation about getting kids outside, we're seeing a real resurgence of nature schools and forest kindergartens in cities. Um, there's one in Brooklyn, for example, in Park Slope. And these are uh, six to 12 week courses where kids are basically um, experiencing kindergarten outside. So they're learning um, about nature, they're learning about socializing, they're learning about responsibility and leave no trace initiatives. Um, and it's giving them the confidence to be empowered outdoors, which is really super important. And again, with this problem we're having with children ad addicted to technology and obsessed with their iPhones, I mean, this is a great way to counter that and offer them some um, holistic solutions. And then again, even really getting to connect with your kids on a more um, visceral level is really beautiful. Um, Little Hiker is a new line of subscription boxes. Um, so we know that subscription boxes have been really popular for adults. Karen is one of the brands that I work with um, that I, you know, they're having a really interesting um, amount of growth with their subscription model. And now we're even seeing a um, subscription model for kids. So it's almost as like kids are the new consumer in the outdoor industry. And that's like never happened. I mean, it's really hard to find brands making product for kids even in this um, convention center. Uh, Shanty from Hike It Baby actually 
um, is trying to source and bring together all the comedies making kids apparel so she can then share that with her network. And she's the founder of Hike It Baby. That's the organization I mentioned earlier. That's 40,000 people strong in this country of people hiking with their children. And a lot of them in cities like Portland, Los Angeles, New York, not just traditional outdoor hubs. Um, climbing gyms are definitely still on the rise in cities. What's really cool about climbing gyms, though, is that they're not just gyms anymore. They're social community environments. There's coffee shops. Um, Brooklyn Boulders just opened a third location in Somerville, Massachusetts. That's a co-working space as well as a climbing gym, as well as a cafe, as well as a retail environment. Um, and I think this kind of goes back to the conversation we were having yesterday about um, creating experiences for consumers rather than creating re more stores. I think that's the same thing reigns true here. It's about creating an experience for the climbing community to come in um, to feel at home. You know, it's not just like come in here, climb, work out, and then leave. It's like come in here, hang out, maybe take a yoga class, jump on the internet, get some work done, grab a coffee, meet with your friends, and it's, it's, it's again creating this holistic 360 degree experience that there's a lot of value added to that. Um, we're looking at hybrid functions for products. So again, products that function in a, in a variety of um, end use cases and oftentimes in different environments simultaneously. Um, the modular system here from Mission Workshop is really great. I mean, it's a backpack system that you can add on to, um, take pieces off and add on to um, throughout your day or whatever your mission is for that day. There's another, there's a few brands actually in Venture Out that also focus on um, modular packs and bags. And I think that becomes more and more important when you think about an urban outdoor enthusiast or a city commuter or someone in a city who's looking to um, get the most miles out of a single product. You know, we need them to function in a variety of environments and a variety of end uses. So we're needing a lot of things packed into one um, product. I also love this um, hybrid sleeping bag jacket from Patagonia. So the bottom is an insulated sleeping bag, and the top is a down jacket uh, with a shell. Um, and again, this celebrating the idea of modular functionality. And um, another really cool concept, this is from Vibram. They have this project called Soul Factor, where you can bring in your regular shoes, your regular boots or sneakers, and have them resold with a Vibram, sold to make them more functional in a variety of environments. Um, so again, just again, this idea of like cross-functionality, which is really interesting, like bringing in a desert boot and getting a really functional sole. I actually brought my Blundstones in and had them resold, and um, I just feel like they gave them a whole new purpose in life. And the on-demand um, industry is also impacting outdoor in a way we've never really seen. So the sharing economy, the Airbnb effect, the Ikeaization of outdoor subscription boxes, Wi-Fi when you want it, things that are powered by the sun. I mean, all of this plays a big role. Um, the camper box is actually a box, a modular box that packs down. Um, and you can convert your car into um, a van, if you will, I guess, some, uh, a, giving you a sleeping um, option in the back of your truck. There's also native vans, which is a, a van rental service. So you don't, if you don't have a van, you can actually rent a van now, which is really crazy. Um, and they're kind of billing themselves as like the Airbnb of, of camper vans. There's also a lot of gear rental companies and community shared companies. So everything you need to camp is delivered right to you. Um, this is again a great opportunity for novice outdoor enthusiasts where the barrier to entry is typically gear. So this is really, really popular in cities around the country and also a great uh, affiliate program to maybe get your brand involved in if you're looking to connect with outdoor enthusiasts and don't want to, um, you know, don't know how to really kind of get into that, into that lane, the, uh, gear rentals might be a great opportunity for it. And the wellness industry is still having a very, uh, kind of lasting effect and lasting impression on outdoor. Um, this image here is from, um, what was it? The forest app? No, the, uh, the, the clothing. Western Rise. Yeah, this is a mindfulness collection from Western Rise, which is really interesting. Um, creating 
apparel for meditating. We know that meditation is kind of the next big public health movement, kind of what we saw happen with yoga in the 90s is happening right now with mindfulness and meditation. Last show, we actually did a group meditation here at the ranger station. Um, so I think that it's just going to become more and more part of the conversation. Sound baths, self-care, um, digital tranquility. This app here is really fun. It's actually an app meant to distract you from <laughs> being uh, digitally active. It is um, about collecting trees. When you're feeling like you're losing focus, you go to this app and you collect trees and you keep these trees alive. Um, and if you stop paying attention to it, the tree dies. Um, so it's kind of interesting that it's about focusing but encouraging um, a relationship with a, with a digital device as well. So that's our very quick overarching presentation. Keep in mind, this is a, a skim. This is just a big general presentation, but if you want something that's more refined and more specific to the brands you're working with, we create these presentations specifically for brands. So please come um, and speak with us if you're interested in that. Um, also, please pick up a copy of Range Magazine. Issue 7 has a lot of um, the content that I presented today in this presentation in the pages, so it's a nice takeaway. And um, thank you all for coming early before the show, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you guys around. Thank you.